I can tell by your questions. Your heart has been broken. Squad 91, engine 93, rescue 91. See you're not very good. Please, just like Laura, just like don't take my brother from me. And you stood much too long in the rain. Sorry. Squad 91, you're responding at 2022. See my brother, sister, mom, dad, and because of me, the pain that I put them in for the rest of my life, like my family, I'll take a bullet for any one of them. If you reach out to Jesus, he's gonna reach out to So we're about 35 minutes north of Cincy. Is that enough work for one day? The town's called Argonia, Ohio. The farm is where I grew up. There's nothing like being a farm boy and living in the country and, and nothing like working for your father and side by side and you know, a real family, family business. We could left a hay bale. Dad had us out there working. It was school, sports, church, farm, and that was kind of like what we revolved around. Tyler and Casey, the older two, were very easy kids, very compliant, very well-mannered, very well-behaved, and Trey was not. I just remember growing up and like, he was barely able to like feed himself, but yet he was driving like our four-wheeler. It's just like, I don't feel like this is how this is supposed to work. So I remember going to some of the teachers and they were like, oh, Jody, guess what? We ha I have Trey next year, and, and I was like, Oh, yeah, he's not quite like the other one, so be prepared. Lo and behold, within the first month, they were like, okay, this is not the same type of U trick. Um, I was a hellion. I mean, we knew from early on he was going to be a football player. I mean, he broke couches and chairs. I mean, he just he tackled everything. Football around here is, is, is everything. You know, this is what brings this community together. If you're not at a football game on Friday night, what are you doing? Football is everything at Massey. It's just, I mean, it's a lifestyle. We have no towns in Clinton Massey. So the, the football field is the, is the community, and that's where everybody goes, the Friday night lights. If you want to see a community come together, come to our Friday night football game. And if you started on Friday night, you know, you were, you were the dude. This freshman year, he started in basketball and football. He was. He was a player. He definitely had the heart. He had the, he had the inspiration. He had the desire. He had the strength and, and the ability to play. He was a natural. He fell right into place. He, he knew, he understood it very early. I'd say he was just an extension of the coaching staff with his knowledge and, and his work ethic and leadership. You know, he wanted to play Division I football. And I mean, he just didn't talk about it. You know, he, he did what you need to do to, to, to get there. You know, I had Tommy Tuberville write me a handwritten letter from Cincy. I had stuff from Purdue, Kentucky. And it wasn't until later that kind of Ball State came into the picture. And, you know, I came up for a visit and I, I fell in love with the place. Traveling shoes, traveling shoes. I can't wait to wear my traveling shoes. So I got to Ball State August 1st of 2018 for fall camp. The reality hit me quick. When I got there, you know, first week or two wasn't easy. College just hits you right in the face. You, you know, you come from a, you know, a 1,600 acre farm and having all kinds of space to this little dorm room and that's where you're staying. As a freshman, like it's it's really hard to make that adjustment and I know he struggled with it. He's a, he's a homeboy and he'll tell you that. He likes home, but he liked the college life too. Fortunately, he got into a family right away. He left this family and he got into the Ball State football family. 
all 117 of our players on our team, I look at them all as a son. And I think that's part of the responsibility that I have and that I cherish is that when you do have a chance to meet with parents and meet with you know, their significant others, whether it's coaches, uh, in the recruiting process to make sure they know that uh, when they drop them off here at Ball State to start their journey, they're going to be in good hands. With my sister, kind of, she's been through that stuff and had that experience at the Division One level, and she was like, you got to get through the first semester, get through the first season, and then you'll find your foundation, you'll find where you are, and then you can just take off from there. It wasn't easy. It was hard. I always just wanted to come home. You know, I remember walking out to the truck with him, helping him carry his bags, and getting, giving him a hug like we always do. We always said we love you to each other. Tyler was here, and we just hugged like we always did and said goodbye. Do you ever think that could have been the last time you hugged him? Never. Never. Never in a million years, no. No mother does. Squad 91, engine 90, pre rescue 91. A vehicle crash with injuries, 4018 East Route 73. It was just kind of a cold, miserable winter day. I remember it being rainy and cold, not cold enough to snow, just kind of stuck there in between. Battalion 91 responding. I left the house like I do every time, tell the fam bye, tell them I love them. I go about two or three miles, I just get to this point where there's kind of like a, a valley. I just remember kind of hitting my brakes and I was going about 50, 55. And the minute I hit my brakes, my back end just started going out. Uh, for a little while, I, you know, I thought I had control of it. It just sounded like a bomb went off in the car. Battalion 91, you're responding 2018. Uh, single car crash into a guardrail and tree. That right road is extremely icy. On scene, single vehicle crash with entrapment. The driver was pinned between the truck and the tree. And when they got on there and they read the license plate and I heard the return, it comes back to Trey's dad, Daniel Utrick. I go, how bad is it? And usually, you know, get, they're in bad shape, but they're going to be okay. And when I talk to Gross and Ball, he goes, it's, it's bad, it's really bad. You know, he's alive, but it's really bad. I remember thinking at first I saw his heart because I saw this like quivering motion inside the wound. But you could definitely see an organ and then it was just a big pool of blood. And then it was like the grain of the skin kind of pulled apart, separated. The first thing we really needed to focus on was just, you know, packing that wound and controlling the bleeding. I called my lieutenant and I go, hey, I, I know these people, these are friends of ours. Can I go tell the family that way they can get started towards whatever hospital they're gonna take him to? I get over there as quick as I can and as I'm almost there, so I'm like, oh, Gary. And he looked at me and the look on his face told me something had happened, something was wrong. I thought about Dan, I thought about Jody. What do I need to do, Lord, what do I need to do to be there for them? as you, for some reason, are going to allow them to walk through this adverse experience. I didn't really know what to say, so I go around to the back door and I bang on the door. And I remember I was sitting right there and heard the knock on the door. I didn't think anything of it. Dan comes around the corner and you know, you can see he's surprised to see me. And... Because I'm sorry, he goes, yeah, Tyler's been in an accident. And I, I knew it wasn't Tyler because Tyler was here. We'd, we'd all eaten supper together. Casey and Tyler were, were here. So Ty, um, I knew right away it was Trey. I just remember going into 
our living room, kind of dropping to my knees and just praying to God. I didn't know what state he was in. I just knew he was, he was bad. I think the profound thing was, you know, he was telling us, you know, just let it, let him go. You know, he's in Jesus' hands. Just let him go to Jesus. He probably told us that, I'd say four or five good times. Um, he was pretty adamant that he was just ready to go. Like we stopped the car. And we saw the truck just wrapped around the tree. There was a highway patrolman there and uh, I said, I'm the father of Trey Utrecht who had the accident. And I said, I need to get to the hospital. He goes, yeah, we'll, we'll get you through. And I, and I said, you know, is he okay? And he, I remember this is Claire's bell. He said, he goes, well, they haven't told me he's died yet. Please, just like, Lord, just like, don't take my brother from me. <laughs> we just kept making sure we weren't bleeding through packaging to make sure it was getting good oxygen. I think we put a nasal airway in. I remember we had a gold chain. It, it, at first it had a cross on it, and then when we got him out of the car, I don't remember seeing a cross. So I, I never knew what happened to that. When we got to the emergency room, it was this very cold, white, sterile room. And, and there was Trey. You know, it's like, that's not Trey. Trey doesn't, Trey doesn't lay down. He's, he's larger than life. So um, I remember just stroking his hair and I remember bits of glass still in his little short stubby hair. And uh, everything I said, he responded with, I love you, mama. I love you, mama. Being in the waiting room was like, it was, I mean, if there was a hell on earth, it, it felt like it. Dr. Gilkinson, who was the lead vascular surgeon, came out. This was one o'clock in the morning, maybe, and she was just blood covered. And it wasn't like she came over to just Dan and I and the family, she came over to like, all of the Massey community, like we, like we were all one family and she was talking to all of us and she said, I, I stopped the bleeding. Then I realized, I'm like, you know, my gosh, he, he could have, he could bleed out. He, he could have died and she just saved his life. surgeon had given me like a pill vial with a cap and it had his cross on it. And she said this was actually like embedded right over his heart. I knew that cross meant something for him to wear. It wasn't just a, wasn't a decoration for Trey. It was a it was a purpose for him. God, I think it was spiritual warfare that night. I think that scene, I think the devil wanted him. And God wasn't going to let it happen. It was a battle. It was a battle, and I think... I believe the devil tried everything that he possibly could to take him, and it would wreck this community, it would wreck this family, and uh, God had different plans. I think the, the biggest thing was, you know, I, what I thought. I, you know, I, I thought I, I thought I had fought the good fight, and when I woke up, you know, I was, I was just mad. I, 
I was confused. I didn't really realize what had happened to me. And to be honest with you, I thought I was in a dream that I couldn't wake up from. Just the amount of pain and I couldn't move. You know, I've got metal rods sticking out of my arm. Destroyed my whole left arm. Um, I think my ulnar was fractured in two different places. I think it's my radial was fractured in one, but they were completely like snapped. And then my humerus was snapped in half. And then my shoulder had just been basically just tore off by the force of the, the, the tree. And then that had caused a just a massive hole in my chest. And on that side, I think I had four or five broken ribs. And then I broke my back in like three different places. It might have been the fifth, sixth, seventh get day. The coach knew and two other coaches came. And I knew, you know, that, that Coach knew was special and that, you know, he just, he just didn't want my son to be a, a care about him as a player, but as a, as a man. Whatever takes place off the field, if there's challenges, we're going to be there for him. We want to help him through that. And I wanted to make sure he knew whether, you know, you know he was still a young player and he really, you know, hadn't found his way yet on the football field. But um, I wanted him to know how big of a, a part of our family that he was and that we were going to be there for him. Hey Trey, this is Tim Tebow. I just wanted to make this video to hopefully encourage you. I know you're going through a really tough time right now and um, you're facing obstacles you could have never even thought of or imagined and um, I, I can only understand the weight that's on you right now um, but I also know that you're someone of faith and that's what's pulling you through right now and I just wanted to encourage you that, that God loves you and he's got a great plan for your life. It was kind of the, the boost that he needed when, when I think he probably was at his lowest you know, I believe men, we, you know, we're, we're supposed to love too, but, you know, we protect and provide. And, and, you know, I couldn't protect. I couldn't protect him. I didn't protect him. I, I couldn't, I couldn't take the pain away from him. I couldn't, I couldn't do anything. This doctor was talking to our son about prosthetics and amputation. In that moment, I just blew a gasket. And I'm like, what the fire are you doing? It crushed me at the time. I've carried this thing around for how long I've been in that, in all this pain, taking all these pain pills for what? I was like, cut my arm off. I was like, just take it off. I said I want it off. I'd already Googled how long it took for you know, an amputation to heal in six weeks. I was just like, you will not. I was just got like, just super angry. And then the biggest, I was like, why, like, why me? Like, you know, why don't you, why'd you, why, 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 why did I get chosen for this? Like, why do I, why do I have to go through this? I had stayed away from the things that, you know, most high school kids got into, prayed before every game. In my mind, I thought, God, my purpose here was to play football or sports and affect people that way. And by praying and, and, and just playing the game a certain way and just giving him the honor, I thought that was his purpose for me. When I woke up and they told me, you know, you're never gonna be able to play football again. I was like so confused because I was like, that, you know, that's my, I that, thought that was my purpose. And if I can't play sports anymore and I can't play football, then, what, then why am I here? And I just, I lost my faith in a short span of time. You can inspire so many other people, because I know you've already started to inspire so many people, so just keep it up, Trey. God bless you, we're praying for you. <laughs> oh my God. Judy was his nurse. She was just a wonderful lady. She's, she's a tough lady. We honestly just hit it off from the jump. She just treated me like her own. I mean, I'm telling you, like I, with my back being like broke in multiple spots and not being able to really move, I would hit I would hit my button every hour, two hours, just to have her just try to move me, and she was there every time. I watched her just love on him. I mean, they they just had something special right from the get go, and I was like, "You're good. You just you just take care of him, nurse my son back to health, and I will love you." We just became really close, and it was almost like a mother son mother grandson type of a relationship 
I can count on one hand how many times she would have a connection, and that would be twice. Trey was different. Just she, he was family. I, I could tell immediately he, she treated him like family. So that was <laughs> that was a big deal. She's never talked about anybody like that before. One day, it was like day like 28 that I was in the hospital and she'd had me for, I don't know how, how many weeks she'd had me. And, and it's like 10 a.m., 10.30. And I'm like, I, I know her schedule by now. And I'm like, Judy, you're off at 7 a.m. Like, what, like, why don't go home? Like, what are, what are you doing? And she just tears up and she leaves the room. When she met Trey, they were both going through hard times. She had been diagnosed with breast cancer, but she was also experiencing with you know, my dad. He was very sick in and out of the hospital for the four years before that. And so that was very hard. And then he was just this light for her, someone that she could relate to on a mental, emotional level, and I think she could, she felt the need to, to help heal him. And he was doing the same for her, whether he knew it or not. Judy comes back in the room and she goes, Trey, she goes, I'm having a double mastectomy in four hours. She goes, can I just stay here and talk with you? And I'm like, what? And she's like, Trey, there's a faith about you or a spirit about you that she goes, I can't explain. That was when everything changed because in my lowest point of my life, I mean, broken into bed, I can't move. I can't go anywhere without three people helping me. I have a 63 year old woman who is confiding in me and her faith because of something that I'm giving off. And I have been the worst Christian in the past three weeks and for me that was the that was the turning point of my faith my recovery of everything because I I realized I don't know what his plan or purpose was for me at the time but seeing her confide in me and and, and see if see a spirit or a faith in me realized that you know my purpose isn't playing football anymore. My purpose is maybe changing people's lives or helping people through my story. God had a plan. I knew it was going to be for His purpose. And I didn't know what it was going to look like. But I think it was in that moment that the trajectory of His life changed. I think He knew you know, his moment of why me and why did this have to happen to me when my life was going to be a football player and a Division One college athlete, that that completely just went away with Judy. I think he knew, I think that's when he figured out my story, my pain. All of this is gonna mean something, and it's gonna impact some people, and it's gonna start with this woman. And it did, it did. It, it, was, it was a tough month, and at that time, it was the only time earlier I'd seen Trey cry. We were out there, and he was walking, and the arm was just, just dead weight would not work and he just, he said, I want it off, Dad. I want, I want it off. I can't do anything. I tried to keep a positive attitude, but it was one of those days, it was, it was not a good day. So Dad's like, what do you want to do? Like, he just wanted to get, get me out. He's like, you want to go fishing? Like, I hadn't, I hadn't even been out of the house. Like, I'd walked, but I had not been in a car since other than going to like a doctor appointment. So for him to be like, do you want to go fish? Do you want to go, you know, do this, do that? I was like, my eyes kind of lit up and I was like, Dad, I don't want to fish. Like, I just want to go back to Ball State. I said, I just want to see my family. I want to see Coach New and all my brothers. 
doing, man? How you feeling? No longer did I walk into the door and you know all the coaches are high five and dapping me up. And it, theirs were probably the one thing that I could say that truly just inspired Trey and where, where we saw, you know, where mentally I knew he's going to be okay. To be able to try to provide, you know, some positivity, you know, to his life at that time, knowing that I'm sure he was going through a lot of emotions about, you know, not being able to play the game. Uh, that he loved and they worked extremely hard to become a Division I football player. I know he wanted to be here tonight. Uh, he has to take the message for us, but it's my honor uh, to present the Marquez Inspiration Award to Trey and Trey. What? It's impossible. I'll, I'll never be able to repay them either because just for, and from an emotional and a mental standpoint like that, that helps more than um, you can even imagine. And those will be like lifelong friends from now on that I'll never, I'll never forget. It was a devastating injury to Trey that ended his playing days on the football field, but I wanted to make sure that he knew we wanted him to be here as long as he wanted to be here. But we would find a role for him and we would let that role grow uh, as he became more comfortable and more confident. I mean, before I even came back to campus, Stockton either tweeted it or he texted me. And he was like, I'm ready for you to be my assistant whenever you're ready and like that, that that just put a big smile on my face and that was that was super uplifting yeah, Lozen. Yeah, Lozen. Yeah. it's awesome to have him around here you know every day whenever we do have a team meeting or whenever we have a practice or whenever we have a workout we, we can't start that meeting until trey is here because he's just a big as big a part of it as everybody else i think my purpose now is just affecting people, getting to heaven and trying to bring as many people with me. And if I can do that and affect as many people's lives that way and just showing them that whatever adversity that life throws at you, that you can get through it no matter what it is. We have exactly the same tray that we had before, but an even better version of him. He's a miracle. He's truly a miracle. I can tell by your questions Your heart has been broken See so you're not very good At hiding your pain And you stood much too long in the rain Let's do it guys, grab it, so Meet me out here? What? <laughs> it's impossible. Do it again. No. Yeah. <laughs> and the skies, they are blue. And our lives are a river. We almost wade through. But if you reach out to Jesus, He's going to reach out to you.